The year was 1956 and the place was Dartmouth College. In a research proposal, a math professor used a term that was then entirely new and entirely fanciful, artificial intelligence. There's nothing fanciful about AI anymore. The directors of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, John Echemendy and Fei-Fei Li, on Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Philosopher John Echemendy served from 2000 to 2017 as provost here at Stanford University. Dr. Echemendi received his undergraduate degree from the University of Nevada before earning his doctorate in philosophy at Stanford. He earned that doctorate in 1983 and became a member of the Stanford Philosophy Department the very next year. He's the author of a number of books, including the 1990 volume, The Concept of Logical Consequence. Since stepping down as provost, Dr. Echemendi has held a number of positions at Stanford, including, and for our purposes today, this is the relevant position, co-director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Born in Beijing, Dr. Fei-Fei Li moved to this country at the age of 15. She received her undergraduate degree from Princeton and a doctorate in electrical engineering from the California Institute of Technology. Now a professor of computer science here at Stanford, Dr. Li is the founder once again of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Dr. Lee's memoir, published just last year, The Worlds I See, Curiosity, Exploration, and Discovery at the Dawn of AI. John Echemendi and Fei-Fei Lee, thank you for making the time to join me. Thank Pleasure, you for Peter. inviting um, us. I would say that I'm going to ask a dumb question, but I'm actually going to ask a question that is right at the top of my form. What is artificial intelligence? I have seen the term a hundred times a day for, what, several years now, I have yet to find a, con a succinct and satisfying explanation. Let's see. Well, let's go to the philosophy. Here's a man who's professionally rigorous. Um, but here's a woman who actually knows the yeah, answer. Actually knows the answer. <laughs> so no, let Fefe answer, and then I will give you a different answer. Oh, really? All right. Okay. Uh, Peter used the word succinct, and I'm sweating here. So, because uh, artificial intelligence by today is already a collection of, um, of methods and tools that summarizes the overall uh, area of computer science that has to do with data, um, pattern recognition, decision making. Um, in you know natural language, in images, in videos, in robotics, in speech. So it's really a collection. At the heart of artificial intelligence is statistical modeling, such as machine learning, using computer programs. But uh, today, artificial intelligence truly is an umbrella term that covers many things that we're starting to feel familiar about. For example, language intelligence, language modeling, or speech, or vision. John, I, you and I both knew John McCarthy, right. who came to Stanford after, after he wrote that, used the term, mm -hmm. coined the term artificial intelligence, the, now the late John McCarthy. And I confess to you who knew him, as I did, that I'm a little suspicious of the term because I knew John, and John liked to be provocative. And I am thinking to myself, wait a moment, we're still dealing with ones and zeros. Computers are calculating machines. Artificial intelligence is a, is a marketing term. So, no, it's, it's not really a marketing term. So I will give, a, give you an answer that is more like what John would have given. All right. And that is, uh, it's, it's the field, the subfield of, of computer science that attempts to create machines that can accomplish tasks that seem to require intelligence. So, the early, you know, early artificial intelligence were systems that that played chess or checkers, even you know, very very simple things. Now, John, who, as you know, if you knew him, uh, was uh, ambitious, and he thought that in a summer conference at Dartmouth they could solve most of the problems. <laughs> All right, can, 
I'm going to come, uh, let me name a couple of very famous events. What I'm looking for here, I'll name the events. We have, in 1997, a computer defeats Garry Kasparov at chess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big moment for big the first blue. time. Yep. Big Blue, an IBM project, defeats a human being at chess. And not just a human being, but Garry Kasparov, who by some measures is one of the half dozen greatest chess players who ever lived. Mm -hmm. And as best I can tell, computer scientists said, yawn. Things are getting faster, but still. And then we have, in 2015, a computer defeats Go expert Han Fue, and the following year it defeats Go grandmaster Lee Sedol. I'm not yes. at all sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Lee Sedol. Yeah. In a five-game match, and people say, whoa, something just happened this time. So what I'm looking for here is something something that a layman like me can latch onto and say, here's the discontinuity. Here's where we entered a new moment. Here's artificial intelligence. Am I looking for something that doesn't exist? No, no, I think you're not. So, so the difference between Deep Blue and- Which played chess. Which played chess. Deep Blue was written using traditional programming techniques. And what Deep Blue did is it it would, for each move, for each position of the board, it would look down to, to all the possible- Every conceivable every, decision tree? Every, every decision tree, uh, to a certain depth. I, I mean, obviously, you can't go all the way. And it would, it would have ways of, of weighing which ones are best. And so then it would say, now, this is the best move for me at this time. That's why, in some sense, it was not theoretically very interesting. The, uh, the Go, Al AlphaGo. AlphaGo, which was a Google project. Was is that yes. Google project. All right. This uses uh, uh, deep learning. It's a neural net. It's not explicit, pr explicit programming. We don't know, you know, we don't go into it with an idea of here's the algorithm we're going to use. Do this and then do this and do this. So it was actually quite a surprise, particularly AlphaGo. Not to me, but <laughs> sure. No, no, no. no. But <laughs> to the public, yes. Yeah, to the public. Yeah. But our, our colleague, I'm go going at this one more time because I really want to understand this. I really do. Our colleague here at Stanford, ZX Shen, who must be known to both of you, the physicist here at Stanford, and he said to me, Peter, what you need to understand about the moment when a computer defeated Go. Go, which is uh, a much more complicated, at mm -hmm. least in the decision space, much, mm -hmm. much bigger, so to speak, yep. than chess. There are yep. more pieces, more square, all right. Yeah. And ZX said to me that whereas chess just did more quickly what a committee of grandmasters would have decided on, the computer in Go was creative. It was pursuing strategies that human beings had never pursued before. Is there something to that? Yeah, so there is a famous uh, Fei Fei's getting impatient with me. I'm asking such No, no, ahead. you're asking such good questions. So in the third game of the, I think it was the third game of the f uh, five games, there was a move. I think it was move 32. 32, 32 or 35. Mm -hmm. It's that uh, the computer program oh, made a move that really surprised every single Go masters. Not only Lisa Do himself, but everybody who's watching. Ooh. That's a very that's Ooh. a very surprising move. I thought I thought it was I thought it was a mistake. In fact, even post analyzing how that move came about, um, the human masters would say this is completely unexpected. And uh, what happens is that um, the computers, like John says, right, is um, has the learning ability and has the inference ability to think about patterns or to, to, to um, decide on certain movements, even outside of uh, the trained, familiar human master's uh, domain of knowledge okay. in this particular so, case. May so, Peter, I? Let me, yep, go let ahead. Me, yes, let me yes, yes. expand on that. The thing is, these deep neural nets are supremely good pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. systems. But the patterns they recognize, the patterns they learn to recognize, are not necessarily exactly the patterns that humans recognize. So it was seeing something about that position, and it made a move that, because of the, the 
the patterns that it recognized in the, in, in the board that made no sense from a human standpoint. In fact, all of, the, all, all of the lessons in how to play Go tell you never make a move that close to the edge that, that quickly. And uh, so everybody thought it made a mistake. And then it proceeded to win. And, and I think the way to understand that is it's just seeing patterns that we don't see. It's computing patterns that, that is not traditionally human. Mm -hmm. And it has the capacity to compute. OK. I'm trying to, we're already entering this territory. But I am trying really hard to tease out mm -hmm. The wait a moment, these are still just machines running zeros and ones, bigger and bigger memory, faster and faster ability to calculate, but we're still dealing with machines that run zeros and ones. That's one strand. And the other strand is, as you well know, 2001 Space Odyssey, where the computer takes over the ship. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Okay, we'll keep, we'll keep, we'll come to this soon enough. Fei-Fei Li, in your memoir, The Worlds I See, quote, I believe our civilization stands on the cusp of a technological revolution with the power to reshape life as we know it. Revolution, reshape life as we know it. Now, you're a man whose whole academic training is in rigor. Are you going to let her get away with, with this over, kind of wild overstatement? No, I don't think it's a, an overstatement. Oh! <laughs> I think she's right. He no, told me to write you. the book. <laughs> <laughs> mind you, Peter, it's a technology that is extremely powerful that will allow us and is allowing us to get computers to do things we never could, could have programmed them to do. And, and it will change everything, but it's like a lot of people have said it's like electricity or it's like like the steam revolution. It's not something necessarily to be afraid of. It, it's not that it's going to suddenly take over the world. That's not what Fei Fei was saying. Wow, right. It, it, okay. It's a powerful tool that will revolutionize industries and human, the way we live. But the word revolution is not that it's a conscious being. It's just a powerful tool that changes things. I would find that reassuring if a few pages later, Fei Fei had not gone on to write. Oh no. There's no separating the beauty of science from something like, say, the Manhattan Project, close quote. Nuclear science, we can produce abundant energy, but it can also produce weapons of indescribable horror. Uh, AI has boogeymen of its own, whether it's killer robots, widespread surveillance, or even just automating all 8 billion of us out of our jobs. Now, we could devote an entire program to each of those boogeymen, and maybe at some point we should. But now that you have scared me, even in the act of reassuring me, and in fact, it throws me that you're so eager to reassure me that I think maybe I really should be even more scared than I am. Let me just go right down. Here's the killer robots. Let me quote the late Henry Kissinger. I'm just going to put these up and let you, mm -hmm. you, you may calm me down if you, if, you, if you can. Henry Kissinger, if you imagine a war between China and the United States, you have artificial intelligence weapons. Nobody has tested these things on a broad scale and nobody can tell exactly what will happen when AI fighter planes on both sides interact. So you are then, I'm quoting Henry Kissinger, who is not a fool after all. So are, you are then in a world of potentially total destructiveness, close quote. Fei Fei? So like I said, I'm not uh, denying how powerful these tools are. I mean, humanity before AI has already created tools and technology that are very destructive, could be very destructive. We talk about Manhattan Project, right? But uh, that doesn't mean that we should collectively decide to use this tool in this destructive right, so way. Come to the break. Okay, right. Peter, you know, think back before you even had heard about artificial intelligence. Which actually, what is it five years ago? <laughs> no, maybe. I know. This no, is no, all no. happening just, so fast. Just, right. just five years ago or 10 years ago. Right. Remember the, the tragic uh, incident where uh, an Iranian uh, passenger plane was shot down flying over the Persian Gulf uh, by an Aegis system. Yes, yes. Right? 
and one of our ships. One of our ships, an automation, a, an automated system, because it had to be automated in order to be if fast humans enough. can't react that yeah, fast. Exactly, and uh, in this case, it, for, for reasons that I think are quite understandable now that you understand the in incident, but it did something that was horrible. That's not different in kind from what you can do with, a, with AI, right? So we as creators of, of these devices or as users of AI have to be vigilant mm -hmm. about what kind of use we put them to. And when we decide to put them to one particular use, and, and, and there may be uses, you know, I'm sure the military has many good uses for them, we have to be vigilant about their doing what we intend them to do rather than doing things that we don't intend them to so do. So you are announcing a great theme, and that theme is that what Dr. Fei-Fei Li has invented makes the discipline to which you have dedicated your life, philosophy, even more important, not less so. Yeah, that's why we're the, power the co directors. Of this instrument that makes the human being more important, not less so. Am I making that? Am I being glib, or is that on to? So let me that... tell you. Uh, let me tell you a story about. Uh, so Fei Fei used to live next door to me, or close to next door to me, and uh, I was talking. I'm not sure to whether her. that would make me feel more safe or more <laughs> exposed. No. And, and and I was talking to her. I was still provost at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, and she said to me. Uh, you and John Hennessy started a lot of institutes that brought technology into other parts of the university. We need to start an institute that brings philosophy and ethics and the social sciences into AI because AI is too dangerous to leave it to the computer scientists alone. <laughs> Nothing wrong with computers. There are many stories about how hard it was to persuade him when he was provost. You succeeded. Can I want just one more boogeyman briefly? Yeah. The, and we'll return to that theme that you just gave us there. That we'll get back to the Stanford Institute. I'm quoting you again. This is from your memoir. Mm -hmm. The prospect of just automating all billion of us out of our jobs. That's the phrase you used. Well, it turns out that it took me mere seconds using my AI-enabled search algorithm, search device, to find a Goldman Sachs study from last year predicting that in the United States and Europe, some two-thirds of all jobs could be automated, at least to some degree. So why shouldn't we all be terrified? Henry Kissinger, world apocalypse, all right, maybe that's a bit too much, but my job. So I, I think job... Uh change is real. Job change is real with every single technological advances that humanity, human civilization has faced. You know, that, mm -hmm. that is real and that's not to be taken lightly. Uh, we also have to be careful with the word job. Job tends to describe a holistic profession or that a person attaches its, uh, his or her income as, as well as- And often identity. Really. Identity yes. with, but there is, also within every job, pretty much within every job, there are so many tasks. You know, it's hard to imagine there's one job that has only one singular task, right? Like um, being a professor, being a scholar, being a doctor, being a, a cook. All of these jobs have mul multiple tasks. What we are seeing as technology is um, changing how some of these tasks can be done. And it's true, as it changes, these tasks, some of them, some part of them uh, could be automated. It's starting to change how the jobs are and eventually it's gonna impact jobs. So this is gonna be a gradual process and it's very important we stay on top of this. This is why Human Center AI Institute was founded is these questions are profound. They're by definition multidisciplinary. You know, computer scientists alone cannot do all the economic analysis, but economists not understanding what the what these uh, computer science um, programs do, do will not by themselves understand the, the shift of the jobs. Okay, John, may so, I tell you? Go yeah, ahead. But, but let me, say, let me yeah. just point something out. Um, the Goldman Sachs study said that such and such percentage of jobs 
will be automated or can be automated at least in part. Yes. Okay. Now, what they're saying is that a certain number of the tasks mm -hmm. that go into a particular Filing, job, right? research. Exactly. Right. So, so, Peter, you said it only took me a few seconds to go to the computer and find that article. Guess what? That's one of the tasks that would have taken you a lot of yes, time. It would have. So part of your job has been automated. Okay, now let me tell you a story. But also and empowered. See, empowered. Yeah. Empowered, okay, exactly. fine. Thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. You're making me feel good. Now let me tell you a story. All three of us live in California, which means all three of us probably have some friends down in Hollywood. And I have a friend who was involved in the writer's strike. Yeah. Okay, and here's the problem. To run a sitcom, you used to run a writer's room. Mm -hmm. And the writer's room would employ seven, a dozen, on the Simpsons show, the cartoon show, they'd keep, mm -hmm. they'd had two, a couple of writer's rooms running. They were employing 20, and these were the last kind of person you'd imagine a computer could replace because they were well-educated and witty and quick with words. And you think of computers as just running calculations, maybe spreadsheets, maybe, maybe someday they can eliminate accountants, but writers, Hollywood writers. And it turns out, and my friend illustrated this for me by saying, doing the, the uh, artificial intelligence thing where it had a, a prompt, draft a skit for Saturday Night Live in which Joe Biden and Donald Trump are playing beer pong. Mm -hmm. 15 seconds. Now, professionals could have tightened it up or made it, but it was pretty funny and it was instantaneous. And you know what that means? That means you don't need f four or five of the seven writers. You need a senior writer, to assign intelligence, the senior, the artificial, and you need uh, maybe one other writer or two other writers to tighten it up or redraft it. It is upon us. And your artificial intelligence is going to get bad press when it starts eliminating the jobs of the chattering classes. And that has already begun. Tell me I'm wrong. Do you know, before the agricultural revolution, something like 80, 90% of all the people in the United States were employed on farms. Right. We now it, now it's down to two percent or three percent, right. and we, and those same farms, that same land, is far far more productive. Now, would you say that your life or anybody's life now was worse off than it was, say, in the eighteen nineties when everybody was working on the farm? No. So yes, you're right. It will have it will change jobs. It will make some jobs easier. It will make uh, allow us to do things that we could not do before. And yes, it will allow there will be fewer there will be f allow fewer people to do more of what they were doing before. And and consequently there will be fewer people in that line of work. Yeah. That's true. I, that is true. I, I also want to just point out two things. One is that jobs is always changing, and that change is always painful. And we're, as computer scientists, as philosophers, also as citizens of the world, we should be empathetic of that. And nobody is saying we should just ignore that changing pain. So this is why we're studying this. We're trying to talk to policymakers. We're, we're, ta okay. we're educating the population. In the meantime, I think we should give more credit to human creativity in, in the face of AI. I, I, I start to use this uh, uh, example that's not even AI. Think about the advanced, uh, speaking of Hollywood, uh, graphics uh, uh, technology, CGI, and all that, right? The video gaming industry? or No, or no, just, just all... uh, animations all right, and sure. all mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. One of many of our including our children's favorite animation series is by Ghibli Studio. You know, uh, Princess Mononoke, My Neighbor Totoro, um, Spirited Away. All of these were made during a period where computer graphics technology is far more advanced than these hand-drawn uh, animations. Yet, 
their the beauty, the creativity, the the emotion, the uniqueness in this film continue to inspire and and just entertain humanity. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to still have that pride and also give the credit to humans. Let's not forget our uh, creativity and emotion and intelligence is unique. It's not going to be taken away by technology. Thank you. I, I feel slightly reassured. <laughs> I'm still nervous about my job, but I feel slightly reassured. But you mentioned government a moment ago, which leads us to how we should regulate AI. Let me give you two quotations. I'll begin, I'm coming to the uh, quotation from the two of you, but I'm going to start with a recent article in the Wall Street Journal by Senator Ted Cruz of Texas and former Senator Phil Graham, also of Texas. Quote, the Clinton administration took a hands-off approach to regulating the early internet. In so doing, it unleashed extraordinary economic growth and prosperity. The Biden administration, by contrast, is impeding innovation in artificial intelligence with aggressive regulation, close quote. That's them. This is you. Also, a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, John Etchemendy and Fei Fei Li, quote, President Biden has signed an executive order on artificial intelligence that demonstrates his administration's commitment to harness and govern the technology. President Biden has set the stage and now it is time for Congress to act. Cruz and Graham, less regulation. Etchemendy and Li, Biden administration has done well. Now Congress needs to give us even more. No. All right, John. So, yeah. no, I, I don't agree with that. So, I believe regulating any kind of technology is very difficult, and you have to be careful not to regulate too soon or not to regulate too late. Mm -hmm. Let me give you another example. You talked about the Internet, and it's true. Uh, the, the government really was quite hands-off, and that's good. That's good. It, it worked out. It worked out. But now let's also think about social media. Social media uh, has, has not worked exactly, worked out exactly the way we wanted. Right? We, we originally believed that we were going to have, enter a golden age in which- Friendship, comedy. Yeah, well, and, and everybody would have a voice. And you know we could all live together, kumbaya, and so forth. And that's not what happened. No. Um, Jonathan Haidt has a new book out on the particular pathologies among young people right. from all of these social right. media. And with, I, not an argument, it's an argument, but it's based on lots of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> it seems to me that I, I'm, I'm in favor of very light handed and informed regulation to try to put up sort of bumpers, or I don't know what the analogy Guard is, guardrails. Uh, for, for the technology. I am not for uh, heavy-handed, top-down regulation that, that stifles innovation. Okay, yeah. here's, here's another, let me, let me get on to th this. Um, you can, I'm sure you'll be able to adapt your answer to this question too. Okay. I'm continuing your Wall Street Journal piece. Mm -hmm. Big tech companies can't be left to govern themselves. Around here, Silicon Valley, those are fighting words. Academic institutions should play a leading role in providing trustworthy assessments and benchmarking of these advanced technologies, we encourage an investment in human capital to bring more talent to the field of AI with academia and the government." Close quote. Okay, now, it is mandatory for me to say this, so please forgive me, my fellow Stanford uh, employees, apart from anything else. Why should academic institutions be trusted? Half the country has lost faith in academic institutions. DEI, the whole woke agenda, anti-Semitism on campus. We've got a Gallup, recent Gallup poll showing the proportion of Americans who expressed a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in higher education this year came in at just 36%, and that is down in the last eight years from 57%. You are asking us to trust you at the very moment when we believe we have good reason to knock it off. Yeah. Trust you? Okay, so, so I'll start with this uh, first half of the answer. I'm sure John has a lot to say. I do want to make sure, especially wearing the hats of uh, co-directors of, uh, of HAI, when we talk about the relationship between government and technology, mm -hmm. we tend to use the word regulation. I really, really want to double click. I want to use the word policy. 
and Double policy click, right? and regulation um, are related but not the same. When John and I write, wrote that Wall Street Journal opinion piece, we really are focusing on a piece of policy that is to uh, resource public sector AI, to resource academia, because we believe that AI is such a powerful technology and science, and academia and public sector still has a role to play to, uh, to create public good. And public goods are curiosity-driven knowledge exploration, are cures for cancers, are, you know, the maps of biodiversity of our globe, are, you know, discovery of nanomaterials that we haven't seen before, are different ways of expressing in, in theater, in, in writing, in music. These are public goods. And uh, when we are looking, uh, when we are collaborating with the government on policy, we're focusing on that. So I really want to make sure, uh, regulation, we all have personal opinion, but there's more than regulation in policy. John, yeah. Wait, so, yeah. we, yeah, I, look. Can, I, can, can, let me make one last run at you. Okay. And in my theory here, although I'm asking questions that you'd, I'm quite sure you'd like to take me out and swap me around at, the, at this point, John, but this is serious. You've got the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, and that's because you really think this is important. Yeah. But we live in a democracy, and you're going to have to convince a whole lot of people. So let me take one more run at you and then hand it back to you, John. Your article in the Wall Street Journal again. We, let me repeat this. We encourage an investment in human capital to bring more talent to the field of AI with academia and the government, close quote. That means money. An investment means money, and it means taxpayers' money. Here's what Cruz and Graham say in the Wall Street Journal. The Biden regulatory policy on AI has everything to do with special interest rent seeking. Stanford faculty make well above the national average income. We are sitting at a university with an endowment of tens of billions of dollars. John, why is not your article in the Wall Street Journal the very kind of rent seeking that Senator Cruz and Senator Graham are saying, are you kidding? Peter, let's take another uh, example. So one of the greatest policy decisions that this country has ever made mm -hmm. was when Vannevar Bush, advisor to, at the time, President Truman, uh, convinced... He stayed on through Eisenhower, as I recall, so it's important yeah, to yeah, know he's no, by, bipartisan, no, exactly. bipartisan. Exactly. No, right. no, it was, it, was not a, it was not a partisan issue at all, but convinced uh, Truman to set up the NSF for funding... National Science Foundation. Right, for funding uh, curiosity-based research, advanced research at the universities. And then not to cut, not to, you know, say that companies don't have any role, not to say that government has no role. They both have roles, but they're different roles. And com uh, companies are tend to be better at development, better at producing products and, and tapping into things that can, within a year or two or three, can, can be a product that will be useful. Uh, scientists at, at universities don't have that constraint. They don't have to worry about when is this going to be commercial. commercial right. right? And, and that, has, that has, I think, uh, had such an incalculable effect on the prosperity of this country, on the fact that we are the leader in, in every technology field. It's not an accident that we're the leader in every technology field. We, weren't, we didn't used to be. And, and does it affect your argument if I add it also enabled us or contributed to a victory in the Cold War? Yeah. The weapon systems <laughs> that, that came out of universities? All right. Well, no, absolutely, and, right. and, and uh, you know, President Reagan, In other words, Star it, Wars. It, it ended up being a, a defensive democracy. Kind of good. You could argue from all kinds of points of view, as it was a good ROI for taxpayers' money. Yeah. So right. we're not arguing. We're not arguing for higher salaries for faculty or anything of that sort. But we think, particularly in AI, it's gotten to the point where uh, faculty, where, where scientists at universities, can no longer play in the game because of the cost of the computing, the cost, the, the inaccessibility of the data. That's why you see all of these developments coming out of companies. 
Okay. That's great. Those are great developments. But we need to have also people who are exploring these technologies without looking at the product, without being driven by the, the profit motive. And then eventually, hopefully, they will develop discoveries, they will make discoveries that will, be, will then be commercializable. Okay. I noticed in your book, Feifei, I was very struck that you said, uh, I think it was about a decade ago, 2015, I think, was the, that you noticed that you were beginning to lose colleagues mm -hmm. to the private sector. Yeah. Uh, presumably because they just pay so phenomenally well around here in Silicon Valley. But then there's also the point that to get to make progress in AI, you need an enormous amount of computational power. Yep. And assembling all those ones and zeros is extremely expensive. So exactly. ChatGPT, what is the, with the parent company? OpenAI. OpenAI got started with an initial investment of a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. An initial, friends and family capital of a billion dollars is a lot of money even around here. Okay, that's the point you're making. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, it feels to me as though every one of these topics is worth a day long Seminar. Actually, I think that they are. But. And, and by the way, the, this, this has happened before where the science has become so expensive that it could no longer, that university level research and researchers could no longer afford to do the science. It happened in, in high energy physics. You know, high energy physics used to mean you had a Van de Graaff generator in your office and that was your accelerator and, you know, or, or you could you, get it. You could exactly. do what you needed to you do. do. Right. And then it no longer was, you know, the, the energy levels went, were higher and higher. And what happened? Well, the federal government stepped in and said, we're going to help. We're going to build uh, an accelerator. Stanford, Stanford Linear, Linear Accelerator. Accelerator. Exactly. Sandia Labs, Lawrence Livermore, all these are at least in part federal in, establishments. Well, CERN. Right. CERN, uh, which is European. Right. Well, Fermilab. So it was the first accelerator was, was, was SLAC, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, then Fermilab, and, and so on and so forth. Now, right. uh, CERN is late, actually late in the game, and it's, it's a European consortium. But the thing is, um, we could not continue the science without the help of the government and okay. government. Well, funding. there is another, and then in addition to high, high energy physics and then bio, right? Mm -hmm. Especially uh, uh, with genetic sequencing and high throughput genomics and bi biotech is also changing. And now you see a new wave of um, biology labs that are actually heavily funded by the combination of government and philanthropy and all that, and that, that stepped in to uh, uh, you know, supplement what the traditional university model is. And All so right. we're now here with AI and computer science. Okay, this is, we have to do another show on that one alone, I think. Um, the singularity. Oh, good, this is good, reassuring. You're both I mean, rolling your eyes. <laughs> Wonderful, I feel better about this already. Good. Ray Kurzweil, you know exactly where this is going. Ray Kurzweil writes a book in 2005 that gets everybody's attention and still scares lots of people to death, including me. The book is called The Singularity is Near. And Kurzweil predicts a singularity that will involve, and I'm quoting him, the merger of human technology with human intelligence. He's not saying the tech will, will mimic more and more closely human intelligence. He is saying they will merge. I set the date for the singularity representing a profound and disruptive transformation in human capability as 2045. Okay, that's the first quotation. Here's the second, and this comes from the Stanford Course Catalog's description of the philosophy of artificial intelligence, a freshman seminar that was taught last uh, quarter, as I recall, by one John Echemendi. Here, here's from the description. Is it really possible for an artificial system to achieve genuine intelligence, thoughts, consciousness, emotions. What would that mean? John, is it possible? What would it mean? I think the answer is actually no. And thank <laughs> goodness. I, I think you kept me waiting for a moment. There. I, I think the you know the, the fantasies that that 
Ray Kurzweil and, and others have, have, uh, have been spinning up, I guess that's the way to put it, uh, are stem from a lack of understanding of w how the human being really works and, and don't understand how crucial biology is to the way we work, the way we are motivated, uh, how we get desires, how we get goals, how we get, how we become humans, become people. And what AI has done so far, AI is, is capturing what you might think of as the uh, information processing piece of what we do. So part of what we do is information processing. So but, it's got the right frontal cortex, but it hasn't got the left frontal cortex uh, yet. It's a, yeah, it's an oversimplification, but yes. Imagine that on television, all right. <laughs> so I, I, actually, I actually think it is, first of all, the date. 2045. 2045 uh, is, um, is insane. <laughs> that will not happen. And secondly, it's not even clear to me that we will ever get that. Wait, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. In his defense, I don't think he's saying that 2045 is the day that the machines become conscious beings like humans. It's more an inflection point of the power of the technology that is, you know, um, is disrupting the, 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 well, the society. He's late. he's late. We're already there. Exactly. We? That's what I'm saying. It's. Uh, I think you're being overly generous. <laughs> I, mean, he, I, I, I think that what he means by the singularity is the date at which we create an artificial intelligence system that can improve itself and, and then get into a cycle, a recursive cycle, where it becomes a super intelligence. Yes. And I deny that. He's standard. playing the 2001 Space Odyssey game yeah. here. Look, can I, different question but related question. In some ways, this is a more serious question, I think. Although that's serious too. Here's the late Henry Kissinger again, mm -hmm. quote, we live in a world which has no philosophy. There is no dominant philosophical view. So the technologists can run wild. They can develop world-changing things and there's nobody to say, we've got to integrate this into something. All right, I'm going to put it crudely again. But in China, a century ago, we still had Confucian thought dominant among, at least among the educated classes on my very thin understanding of Chinese history. In this country until the day before yesterday, we still spoke without irony of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which involved certain concepts about morality, what it meant to be human, it assumed a belief in God, but it turned out you could actually get pretty far along even if you didn't believe in God. Okay. And Kissinger is now saying it's all fallen apart. There is no dominant philosophy. This is a serious problem, is it not? There's nothing to integrate AI into. You take his point. It's up to the two of you. You're the philosopher. You're the Buddhist. <laughs> You're the philosopher. <laughs> I think this is a great, first of all, thank you for that quote. I didn't read that quote from uh, uh, Henry Kissinger. I mean, this is why we founded the Human Center AI Institute. These are the fundamental questions that uh, our generation needs to figure out. Oh, so and that's not just a question, that's the question. It was one of the fundamental questions. It's also one of the fundamental questions that illustrates why universities are still relevant today. Right. And, and Peter, you know, one of the things that, that Henry Kissinger says in that quote is that there is no dominant philosophy. Yes. There's no one dominant philosophy like the Judeo-Christian tradition, which used to, used to be the dominant This would be a different in conversation in Paris in the 12th century, for example, the University in, of Paris. In order to have, in order to take values into account mm -hmm. when you're creating an AI system, you don't need a dominant tradition. I mean, there's a, what you need, for example, for, for most ethical traditions is the golden rule. Mm. Okay, so we Confucius. can still get along with each other, 
even when it comes to deep, deep questions of value such as this. We still have enough common ground. I believe so. Oh, I heave yet another sigh of relief. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit. We're talking a little bit about a lot of things here, but th so it is. Uh, let us speak of many things as, as, as it is written in Alice in Wonderland. The Stanford Institute. The Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, of which you are co-directors, and I just have two questions, and respond as you'd like. Can you give me some taste, some feel for what you're doing now? And in some ways more important, but more elusive, where you'd like to be in just five years, say. Everything in this field is moving so fast. I would, my impulse is to say 10 years because it's a rounder number. It's too far off in this field. Fei Fei? I think what really has happened in the past five years by Stanford High, among many things. I just want to make sure everybody is following you. H-A-I, Stanford High, is the way it's known on this campus. Yes. All right, go ahead. Yeah, uh, is that we have put a stick on the ground for Stanford as well as for everybody that this is an interdisciplinary uh, study. That AI, artificial intelligence, is a science of its own. It's a powerful tool. And what happens is that you can welcome so many disciplines to cross-pollinate around the topic of AI or use the tools of AI to make other sciences happen or to explore other new ideas. And that concept of making this an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary field is what I think Stanford High brought to Stanford and also hopefully to, to the world. Because like you said, computer science is kind of a new field. You know, only you know, the late John McCarthy coined the term you know, in the fifth, uh, late 50s. Now it's moving so fast, everybody feels it's just a niche computer science uh, field that's just like making its way into the future. But we are saying, no, look abroad. There's so many disciplines that can be put here. Who competes with the Stanford Institute in human-centered design? Is there such an institute at Harvard or Oxford or Beijing? I don't. I just don't know I what don't those. So, in the in the five years since, since we launched, there have been a number of similar institutes that have been uh, created at other universities. We don't see that as competition in any way. If, shape if or these form. arguments you've been making are yeah. valid, then you we need them. We need. We should, yeah. we should we work. See exactly. that as a movement. We, we need. Okay. We need right. them. Yeah. And part of what we want to do, and part of what I think we've succeeded to a certain extent doing, is communicating this vision of uh, the importance of keeping the human and, and human values at the center when we are developing uh, this technology, when we are, are applying this technology. Uh, and we want to communicate that to the world. We want other centers that adopt a similar point standpoint. And, and importantly, I mean, one of the things that, that Fei Fei didn't mention is one of the things we try to do is educate and educate, for example, legislators so that they understand what this technology is, what it can do, what it can't do. So you're traveling to Washington or the yeah. very generous trustees of this institution are bringing congressional staff and con mm -hmm. they're both. Bring, both, both. Both are happening. Yeah. Both. All right. So Fei Fei, are you, first of all, did you teach that course in Stanford HAI or was the course located in the philosophy department or cross list? I'm just <laughs> trying to get a feel for what's actually taking place there now. Yeah, it was, uh, I actually taught it in the confines of the HAI building. <laughs> okay, so it's an HAI? Um, no, it's a philosophy course. It's listed as a philosophy course, but taught in the HAI. He's the former provost. He gets to, he's an interdisciplinary <laughs> walking wonder. Yeah. And your work in AI-assisted healthcare, yeah. is that taking place in HAI or is it at the, well, that's the medical the, school? That's the beauty. It's taking place in HAI, computer science department, the medical school. It even has collaborators from the law school, from the uh, political science department. So that's the beauty. It's deeply interdisciplinary. Um, if I were the provost, I'd say this is starting to sound like something that's about to run amok. Doesn't that sound a little too interdisciplinary, John? Don't, uh, you, don't we need to define things a little bit here? Let me, let me tell you, let me say something that, uh, so Steve Denning, who was the uh, chair of our board of trustees for many years and, and has been a long, long time supporter of um, 
of the university in many, many ways. In fact, we are the Denning co-directors mm -hmm. of Stanford High, Stanford HAI. Um, well, Steve saw five, six years ago, he said, you know, AI is going to impact Everything. every department at this university. And we need to have an institute that, that makes sure that that happens the right way, that that impact um, is, 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 does not run amok. Mm -hmm. right. Where would you like to be in five years? What's a, what's a course you'd like to be teaching in five years? What's a, what's a special project? I would like to teach a course, freshman seminar called The Greatest Discoveries by AI. Oh, really? Right. Okay. Um, a last question. Which to, I have one last question, but that does not mean that it has, you, each of you has to hold yourself to one last answer because it's a kind of open-ended question. I have a theory, but all I do is wander around this campus. The two of you are deeply embedded here and you ran the place for 17 years, so you'll know more than I will, including you may know that my theory is wrong, but I'm going to trot it out, modest though it may be, even so. Milton Friedman, the late Milton Friedman, who when I first arrived here was a colleague at the Hoover Institution. In fact, by some miracle, his office was on the same hallway as mine and I used to stop in on him from time to time. He told me that he went into economics because he grew up during the Depression. Mm -hmm. And the overriding question in the country at that time was how do we satisfy our material needs? Mm -hmm. There were millions of people without jobs. There really were people who had trouble feeding their families. All right. I think of my own generation, which is more or less John's generation. You come much later, Fei Fei. Thank you. And for us, I don't know what kind of discussions you had in the dorm room, but when I was in college, there were bull sessions about the Cold War, mm -hmm. where the Russians going, the Cold War was real to our generation. Mm -hmm. That was the overriding question. How can we defend our way of life? How can we defend our fundamental principles? All right, here's my theory. For current students, they've grown up in a period of unimaginable pro prosperity. Mm -hmm. Material needs are just not the problem. They have also grown up during a period of relative peace. The Cold War ended you could put different, the Soviet Union declared itself defunct in 1991. Cold War is over at that moment at the latest. The overriding question for these kids today is meaning. What is it all for? Why are we here? What does it mean to be human? What's the difference between us and the machines? And if my little theory is correct, then by some miracle, this technological marvel that you have produced will lead to a new flowering of the humanities. Do you go for that, John? Do I go for it? I would go for it uh, if it were going to happen. <laughs> Did I put that you know? in a slightly sloppy way? Well, no, I, um, I think it would be wonderful. It's something to hope for. Uh, so far, now, now I'm going to be the cynic, uh, so far what I see in, in students is more and more focus, or Stanford students, more and more focus on l technology. On Computer learning, science is on, still the biggest major at this uh -huh. university. Yeah. 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 And, um, and we have tried at HAI, we have actually in, uh, started a program called Embedded Ethics, where the CS at the end of ethics mm -hmm. is capitalized, so it's co computer right. science. And uh, that'll catch the kids' attention. <laughs> no, they don't, we don't have to catch their attention. What, what we do is virtually all of the courses in computer science, the introductory courses, have ethics components built in. So a problem set, so you have a problem set for this week. And that'll have a whole bunch of, you know, very difficult math problems, computer science problems. And then it will have a very difficult ethical challenge. 
and it'll say, here's the situation. You are programming a computer, uh, programming a, a, an AI system, and, and here's the dilemma. Now discuss, right? What, what are you gonna do? So, so we're trying to bring, I and mean, this, is, this is what Feifei wanted, we're trying to bring This is new, ethics within, within a, yeah, the last million. couple of years, yeah. okay. two, three years. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to bring the attention to ethics into the computer science curriculum. Um, and, and partly that's because they're not, I mean, students, students tend to follow the path of least resistance. Well, they also, let's put it again, if I'm, I'm saying things crudely again and again, but someone must say it, they follow the money. So as long as this valley that surrounds us rewards brilliant young kids from Stanford with CS degrees as richly as it does, and it is amazingly richly, they'll go get CS degrees, right? Well, I, I do think it's a little crude. <laughs> I, I think money is one surrogate measure of also what is advancing in our time. You know, technology right now truly is one of the biggest drivers of the changes of our, of our civilization. I, when you're talking about what does this generation of students talk about, I was just thinking that uh, 400 years ago, you know, when the scientific revolution was happening, what is in the dorms? Of course, it's all young men <laughs> in Cambridge or Oxford. But that must also be a very exciting and interesting time. Of course, there was an internet and social media to propel the, the travel right. of the knowledge. But imagine there was, you know, this, the, 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 the blossoming of discovery and of our understanding of the physical world. Right now, we're in that kind of great era of technological uh, blossoming. It's a digital revolution. So. The, the, the conversations in the dorm, I think it's a blend of the meaning of who we are as humans, as well as our relationship to these technology we're building. And so it's a, it's a... So properly, properly taught technology can subsume or embed well, or, philosophy or, literature? Of course, can, can inspire, can inspire, instill. Yeah. And also think about it, what follows scientific revolution is a great period of change of political, social, economical change, right? And we're seeing not that. Not all for the better, that's a... I mean, right, get, and I'm not saying right. it's necessarily for the better, but we are seeing, we're, we haven't even peaked the digital revolution, but we're already seeing the political, social, economic changes. So. This is, again, back to Stanford High when we founded it five years ago. We believe all this is happening, and, and this is an institute where these kind of conversations, ideas, debates uh, should be taking place. Education programs should be happening, and, and that's part of the reason we're, we did this. I, so, uh, let ahead. me tell you, yeah, so uh, as you pointed out, I, I just finished teaching a course called Philosophy of Artificial Intelligence. About which I've, I found out too late. I would have asked permission to audit your course, John. No, no, you're too old. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and about half of the students were computer science students or planned to be computer science majors. Mm -hmm. Another quarter planned to be symbolic systems majors, which is a very... Is a, dis, is a major related. that is related to computer science. And, and then there was a smattering of others. Um, uh, and, and these were people, every one of them, at the end of the course, and I'm not saying this to brag, every one of them said, this is the best course we've ever taken. And why did they say that? It, it inspired, it, it made them think. It gave them a framework for thinking. A framework for trying to address some of these problems, some of the worries that you've brought out today, and and how do we think about them, and how do we, you know, not just become panicked because of some science fiction movie that we've we've seen, or because we read Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> uh, so maybe it's just as well I didn't take the course. I'm sure John would have given me a C minus at best. All right. Yeah. Great inflation. <laughs> so, so it, it's clear that they, you know, these kids, the students, are are looking for 
the uh, opening to to think these things and to understand how to address mm -hmm. ethical questions, how to address hard philosophical questions, um, and and that's what they that's what they got out of the course. And that's a way of looking for meaning in this time. Yes, it is. Mm. Dr. Fei Fei Li and Dr. John Echemendi, both of the Stanford Institute for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson.